Hi there. Welcome to The Preventable, the podcast giving you a seat at the table with conversations about the intersection of alcohol, drugs, and mental health in everyday lives. Take a seat and join us. Welcome to The Preventable. With me today is an esteemed guest, the assistant special agent in charge at the DEA here in St. Louis, Mr. Colin Dickey. Welcome to The Preventable. Well, thank you for having me, Nicole. I really appreciate it the chance and the opportunity to come on here and and talk to you about DEA and what we're doing with DEA and what we're trying to do to uh, target fentanyl drug distribution in our communities and um, target um, overdose-related drug deaths, too. So I want to get into what the DEA does, what it doesn't do, um, because I think there's a lot of um, sometimes like misunderstanding about what your charge is and isn't. And I also, though, before we get there, like I want to just learn a little bit about you. So how long have you been in the DEA? Did you always want to do this? Was this is this kind of new for you or were you like one of those kids that were like, that's going to be me when I'm older? I got into law enforcement. So I grew up in a town, a small town in southern Illinois, 5000 people. Uh, my dad was a fireman and ended up being a fire chief oh. for over 30 years with a local volunteer fire department. So I knew I always wanted to do something in public service. Mm-hmm. And uh, my dad wasn't afraid to run into burning buildings. That's not something I wanted to do. <laughs> so I went the career path of law enforcement. Um, and I knew I wanted to do it at an early age. Uh, like I did a a book report on the FBI in seventh grade, and I did a speech. Oh, okay. I did a speech on it when I was in my sophomore year in college on the FBI and what it meant to me. Obviously, I ended up with the DEA, but it's still obviously in the federal law enforcement realm, and I couldn't be happier with the career decision that I made. Um, I I've been on with DEA for eighteen years now. I, my career started in two thousand four um, after I graduated the the DEA Academy in Quantico, Virginia. I my first assignment was in the Chicago Field Division. Hmm. I was there for 14 years. I did 10 years as a as an agent, working violent street gangs, um, Southwest border investigations, targeting um, criminal ju- drug networks wow. and Mexican uh, drug cartels. Mm-hmm. After that, I promoted uh, to a group supervisor level um, in 2014 to our financial investigations group, where I conducted. Um, money laundering investigations Ooh. throughout throughout the world, which was fascinating. It was something completely different than what I did okay, um, I need for to my have 10 you years as an agent. To talk about cryptocurrency because <laughs> I am so perplexed by it yeah. and I've I've gone down a few rabbit holes trying to figure it out. So maybe we'll have you back to talk about that. No, absolutely. <laughs> and it's a whole nother thing, right? Because when I was an agent, a baby agent cut my teeth, cryptocurrency didn't even exist. Yeah. So as we promote as I promote through this agency New trafficking and trends oh, sure. and, and methods that uh, drug traffickers and money laundering money launderers use comes up, and it's hard for me as a supervisor to get trained on that stuff. So I have to really yep. rely on my agent and supervisor personnel that I supervise in order to get up to speed on that. Mm. Um, but it, it's it's a huge thing, and I would love to be back to talk yeah. to you about that. So I I did my uh, did my time as a group supervisor um, of the financial investigations group from 2014 to 2018. After that, I was selected for a lateral position in our Bogota, Colombia country mm-hmm. office mm-hmm. as a group supervisor, mm-hmm. um, working the best targets, some of the best targets that the, the world has to offer, um, working large maritime shipments of, of cocaine coming Whoa. out of Colombia, being sent up to Central like America. Pablo Escobar stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The Caribbean. It was really fascinating work. Um, and it's different. Obviously, you're speaking a, a foreign language, so that's uh, difficult enough, yes. uh, but you really rely on your relationships with foreign counterparts in that office. You're you're kind of a hybrid agent because you're more of an intelligence gatherer because we don't have some authorities that, that we have up here. We don't have the ability to do that uh, because of laws and procedures in foreign countries. So we really have to rely on our counterparts to be the action element mm-hmm. um, for us in that environment. So I did that for a few years as a group supervisor, and then I took another lateral assignment with our special operations division that's based out of Chantilly, Virginia, but I was still stationed down in Bogota, Colombia. Um, What I did there was I basically coordinated large-scale investigations throughout the world. So maybe I'm supporting a case down in Bogota, Colombia that ties into Dallas, Texas, or St. Mm -hmm. Louis, Missouri, Mm -hmm. or Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. There may be links to Australia or offices in Europe. I bring all those parties together to make sure everybody's up to speed with the overall criminal drug network that we are 
trying to investigate, not just specific targets, but the overall the network. overall network. And then um, I did that for almost two years. And then in 2021, uh, February 2021, I've selected for my current position as assistant special agent in charge of the St. Louis Field Division, St. Louis Division Office. Um, I got up here in April of 2021, and I am basically responsible for overseeing eight DEA enforcement groups of agents and task force officers, which are local police officers deputized mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as DEA agents. They have the same authorities to conduct uh, drug investigations and enforce federal drug laws and statutes. Yeah. Um, so I I supervise eight of those groups currently. I have seven in the Chicago in, in the St. Louis area, and I have one down in uh, Cape Girardeau, mm-hmm. Missouri, as well. So that's my my current job. I also am the commander of our um, uh, OSADEF strike force that sits out um, at a at another location here, um, where it's a mix of law enforcement agencies huh. from from several federal, state, and local agencies. And I also oversee our special response team, which is basically the federal DA equivalent of a of a SWAT team. Wow! So, so basically, tons of free time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, I, I need I need a few time. more titles and a few more duties. Right, exactly. You need <laughs> you need a few more letters behind your name. So, I so you have, I think, really eloquently like kind of described your kind of path and 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 you've touched on a lot of different things that the DEA does right right and so when we sort of met before the podcast so I could kind of you know take some notes and and think a little bit about questions I wanted to ask one of the things that I wrote down and I know this is you know on the website is that you all disrupt dismantle and destroy organizations that is what you do right correct as I said at the beginning there's a lot of I think questions about what it is that DEA's role is, what it's not, you know, but but that really is your charge, right? right. Disrupting, dismantling and destroying criminal organizations. Correct. And specifically I, that have a tie to to drugs. Correct. Right? Okay. Yep. And that's always what we look to do in our investigations. That's what I've always looked to do all the uh, spots I just talked about mm-hmm. throughout my career. That's something we always do. Sometimes our cases start with five members of an organization that we have identified. Sometimes, depending on what intelligence we're operating off of, sometimes it's only one target. Then it's up to us as investigators to try to spread that investigation and take it as far as it can go so we can dismantle. And you said you use the same verbs, I would say, dismantle, destroy, disrupt. Um, You know, we use other terms in in foreign offices like investigate, indict, extradite oh. but we're talking about the biggest targets uh-huh. whether it's foreign or domestic it's our job it's DEA's job to go after those criminal drug networks and so you are not I think just to be pretty clear here you're not go the DEA's job is not to go after my cousin that sells some weed no right DEA is not charged with uh, investigating drug users where we are targeting drug dealers drug distributors suppliers are yeah at the like you kind of want like the person who's selling his person's person the weed to sell exactly okay and the the information that i give my supervisors to tell their agents what i want them to work on how i want them to view their investigations is sometimes they'll start a case from a local impact let's say somewhere in the in a st louis Mm -hmm. area neighborhood start with that well, the next would be more of a regional approach. So that would be the St. Louis metro area yeah, or maybe yeah. touching into southern Illinois. Um, from there, it goes to a national perspective where maybe you ID that a supplier is out in California mm-hmm. or Texas. Then you're looking at Let's like work with another DA and, office yes, right. and let's target those people with another DA office or another law enforcement agency. And then the end all be all is if we can tie a target back to a source country such as Mexico or Colombia, that's the ultimate goal because that's when we're getting to our – priority targets um, that we continue to chase on a daily basis. So earlier you had said that you've kind of seen things evolve, right? And so now sometimes you you rely on some of your staff to sort of fill you in on certain things. And when I first joined Prevent Ed, which was then NCADA, you know, I came on specifically to work with methamphetamine prevention. Right. And at that point in time, there were some super labs, but it was primarily, you know, people purchasing items in their local stores and making it in their homes or a, like a mobile meth lab or something. Well, yes, methamphetamine still is around and it's definitely morphed into super labs and, and 
but but really what we're paying a lot of attention to, what you're paying a lot of attention to, is fentanyl, right? Correct. And so I know that there's been some major successes that you all have had. Um, one case in particular, I know that you all are doing a lot of work with the One Pill Can Kill campaign. So I'm wondering if we could just like talk briefly for those people listening who don't even really understand what fentanyl is and what makes the fentanyl you're looking to tackle different than what is maybe prescribed because somebody's in pain and, you know, so talk a little bit about that if you don't mind. So when we talk about fentanyl, we're talking about illegal fentanyl, not yes. not used for medicinal purposes for pain relief in a hospital setting. The easiest way for me to say it right from the get-go is fentanyl is 50, 50 times stronger than heroin and it's 100 times stronger than morphine. I think that would put it in perspective for people that either know drugs or, or other things that are used for, for pain treatment yeah, right, um, right. In, a, in a hospital setting. Um, so fentanyl is a very dangerous drug, very dangerous substance, um, and, and methamphetamine is still right up there. Those are our two biggest threats mm-hmm. um, in the St. Louis area. I think a lot and probably of people th- think meth has the, gone away. And it hasn't. Right. Um, we seized records amount of both fentanyl and crystal meth last year mm. in the St. Louis division office, which covers Missouri Kansas and Southern Illinois, we seized 188 kilograms of fentanyl in those locations. The two previous years combined, we seized 186. So we seized more this year than we did the two previous years combined. We seized 186 in those two years, 188 this year. Same thing with meth. We set a record with um, over 1,800 kilograms of methamphetamine seized. So Meth, meth, we're seeing methamphetamine in large quantity still. It remains um, our, our one major threat. Fentanyl would be like 1A, 1B, like right. Um, as far as because it's more, it, it's even more of a public safety and a public threat because people don't know about it. Mm-hmm. Or fentanyl is being mixed with other substances. That's right. so you that's might a think huge you're issue. Just getting meth, and I'm using that in quotes, but really your meth could be laced with fentanyl and or, or cocaine, right? I mean, we see people who use cocaine on the weekends recreationally right. who are dying because it's adulterated with fentanyl and. They were just looking for a little hit of energy, and instead, they're dead. We've seen meth mix with um, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine. Oh, fentanyl mixed with those things? Fentanyl mixed wow. with those, and even mar- there's been a few cases where it's been mixed with marijuana, too, mm. which people wouldn't think about that. But there's And they don't want to hear it, because, and, and I think people are reluctant <clears throat> to say it, because you don't want to go to back to the situation where it's like reefer madness, like, mm-hmm. don't, you know, use cannabis because it's tainted with things, but... It actually is. Right. Right. And so how do you get the message out without being that person that is just like, you know, kind of hysterically crying out to people like, don't do drugs. But also like there are dangers. Let's be smart about this. And we've got data to to back it up from our investigations, from lab analysis, from the investigations that we conduct. Um, you know, coordination with the CDC, getting mm-hmm. these numbers. I mean, when we're talking about fentanyl, there's a couple of different threats. You've got regular fentanyl powder, which is being mass produced in places such as in Mexico by criminal drug networks down there. The precursor chemicals that are used to make uh, fentanyl um, are being um, moved from China to Mexico mostly unregulated, mm. and the criminal drug networks down there are mass-producing fentanyl in record quantities, which makes it so dangerous. It's different. Crystal, crystal meth and fentanyl are different from drug threats of the past. When you talk about cocaine and, and heroin, there's still threats, drug threats in the United States and, sure. and in St. Louis. But the big thing and big difference between those and what I would call man-made substances that can be mass produced, such Correct. as fentanyl and crystal meth is, those came from plants, such as the opium poppy for heroin and the coca plant for cocaine, mm. which have to go through seasons of crops and fields and production and manufacturing. With fentanyl and crystal methamphetamine, there's no stop in production or manufacturing. That is so, I've never heard anybody say that before, but it actually makes sense. I mean, when you're manufacturing in a lab, you can control all of different variables. And right. once you figure out how to control for those variables, Nothing is going to stop you or slow you down. Right. Certainly not rain or a poor harvest. Yep. Interesting. So we see threats in the powder. Hmm. We see threats where it's being put into counterfeit pills yes. that are also being produced and manufactured in Mexico by these networks. Um, and people think they're getting a legitimate prescription pill, but they're not. They're getting a pill that contain a lethal dose of fentanyl or a fatal dose, which is only two milligrams. 
um, could, is considered a lethal dose, and that's a very small amount. And when we're talking about that's the equivalent of 10 to 20 grains of salt. I've tried to do that with a salt shaker <laughs> and pour 10 to 20 grains. I can't. No. It always ends up as 40. I'm like, well, that's enough to kill how many people? And so that's really why the DEA has come out with this one pill can kill, especially because there was a, a couple, one in particular, like high profile death of a teenager who was looking to purchase a prescription pill using social media, correct? And um, did not get what they what they wanted, did not get what they thought, and instead got a pill that had been manufactured and contained fentanyl and killed this kid, yep. correct? Yeah, and that, that's a huge risk. Um, kids, and it was like they thought they were getting Adderall or exactly. something, something totally different. And if, if to the untrained eye, and even if I look at two pills without kind of maybe – Touching them, which I wouldn't do yeah, if we have, think fentanyl involved. I have involved. no idea. When I you, go on your website and I look at yep. the two pictures side by side, I'm like, I have no idea these are different. Yeah, the only they have the same markings. The only indicator that I can really see, because I've been doing this for 18 years and tr- being trained up on this stuff, is sometimes the, the fake counterfeit pills will start breaking apart mm. over time, whereas the oh. other ones will stay um, completely together. Interesting. And the big thing is, right, um, if you're talking about yourself in your household or with kids in your household, the big indicator is those pills, if they're for pharmaceutical use prescribed by a doctor or a medical professional, mm-hmm. they should probably be in a bottle with your name on it That's being correct. used for a specific thing. Which is a great segue to the Take Back right. program. So every April and every October, the DEA sponsors a drug Take Back Day. Correct. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and what's the purpose of that day? Those the, days, I should say. The drug, so the drug take back is a great event um, that's handled um, by offices throughout the country in coordination with state, local, and local law enforcement officers. We have drop sites where people can bring unused prescription medication. Mm-hmm. We're talking about you know prescription pills like Adderall, Percocet, oxycodone, hydrocodone, stuff that you would get after a getting your wisdom teeth pulled mm-hmm. or a surgery, or if your your kid has a football injury in high right. school. Those prescriptions run out. Sometimes they're not used. Instead of having those medicines stay in your cabinet, we host the take back twice a year where we have people um, anonymously bring pills to locations, to drop sites in order to turn those pills in so nobody can potentially be affected by using a pill that they shouldn't be putting in their body. And that's really diversion, right? I mean, that's a huge part of what you all do. Another part, and this is the last thing that I really want to make sure that we get to, is that over the last several years, beginning really with the DEA 360 strategy, which was mentioned on our on a previous episode because one of our community coalitions, that's really when they got into this game, so to speak, is because of the DEA 360 strategy where the DEA said, look, we, want, we need to remain focused on diversion. Yep. We want to dismantle these criminal organizations. And we know that it takes a community to do this and how can we um, really lend lend us uh, the resources and the manpower, the people power we have um, to kind of, I'll say, legitimize some of these things, right. right? And so that's really where our work with the DEA kind of like accelerated was right. through DEA 360. But there's now sort of a new version of that kind of right with with some additional outreach and and community efforts can you talk a little bit about that correct so i, I with what we're doing now especially the, the last few years it started with um what you what you just discussed with the 360 strategy i think you could also put that in coordination with the one pill can kill campaign i agree and what we're doing on a new strategy called operation overdrive that our administrator just announced um, a few weeks ago and it was announced locally um, it's basically an overdose and violence reduction initiative, um, trying to target the most violent offenders in certain neighborhoods in 34 cities throughout 23 states across the country. Um, So people committing acts of violence, drug-related violence, gun violence, and contributing to or attributing to an increase in overdose-related deaths, whether that's because of, you know, fentanyl or other opioids or other, other drugs. Obviously, DEA is an enforcement agency. That's what we do. We target the, the biggest, baddest um, offenders um, that are wreaking the most havoc in our neighborhoods and putting poison on the streets. Another avenue of that is we coordinate with state and local law enforcement officers to assist us with these law enforcement operations, but we also engage with community members, whether that's through schools, 
um, organizations such as Prevent Ed, um, com- community members, clergymen, um, parents, getting the message out there about the dangers of, of drug abuse so people know what can be the possible effects of um, drug abuse and um, related violence. And this isn't really new because you all, like, a lot of people listening are familiar with Red Ribbon because it's a day that they get to wear a red shirt to school. But what I don't think a lot of people know is that Red Ribbon was started by the DEA to honor a uh, an agent who was killed. And so y'all realized that we need to do more earlier upstream and that maybe you're not always the ones to do it, but that you can partner and elevate voices of organizations like mine that we can reach kids as well. And so I think that it's I appreciate you coming here today to just talk a little bit about the things that you are currently doing um, to to get the drugs off the streets, but also the things that you have always done. Right. Right. I mean, take back's been around for a long time. Red Ribbon's been around since the 80s. Like this is not new here. Right. And that's a big message I'd like to get across here is um, obviously the majority of the time when we go to arrest people, we're there on people's worst day. Right. We're there arresting people, taking them away from their families, potentially going to prison. Um, But um, it's also we're also there trying to make those communities better Mm -hmm. and safer. There's, you know, in my career, there's always been. drug drug abuse there's been drug distribution it's always been a problem and we're we're trying to do what we can to clean up the streets make these communities safer and healthier and that's a big part of what we try to do is to make these communities better well you have a standing invitation anytime you want to talk about something that y'all are really excited about a new um you know operation that you have um Really, I, I appreciate you coming. I appreciate everything that you do um, and that you're trying to do. No. So thank you very I, much. And I would say likewise to you. I appreciate everything that Prevent Ed does and uh, so many other um, community members and organizations that DEA deals with. It really makes our job a lot easier being able to do what we do and get our message out there. Well, thank you so much. If you liked this conversation with ASAC Colin uh, and you want more, you want to you want to say, yes, I want to hear more about what they're doing. Please consider rating, reviewing and subscribing. Uh, Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you again really soon. Thanks for joining us at The Preventable, brought to you ad-free by Prevent Ed. Prevent Ed works to reduce or prevent the harms of alcohol and other drug use through education, intervention, and advocacy. Please visit their website at prevented.org. Like what you heard? Rate, review, and subscribe to stay up to date with what we are serving on The Preventable.